So everything's a big fat mess today because you know, I, I took in two new devices. Um, we're going to talk about just the state of the computer collection and even some of the big box DOS Windows stuff I have. Yeah, so just for a little background, I've been messing with old PCs since 2001. I've been doing this before L YouTube. <laughs> I'm probably amongst one of the original x86 IBM compatible collectors. I mean, I've got to be. Because when, when I started messing with stuff like this, I mean, this stuff was dinosaurs, door stops, and boat anchors to people. You know, they, they were like, why do you have this old crap? You can't do anything with it. And it was always full of falsehoods, except Pong. I'm here to tell you the state of the collection and talk even a little bit to some of the more normal people who might be watching this. Exactly why guys like me are into ancient x86 IBM compatible hardware. So, let's start with the collection. So, and not everything in this is going to be old. Like this down here is my main workstation. It's a Core 2 Duo P3300. I'm kind of mentioning it because back in about a week, a month ago, there was a post on Vogons, which is uh, one of the forums I hang out on, and they were talking about the Core 2 Duo now. Is it vintage? I'm like, uh, no, it's... I'm, my thoughts are... Here's my thoughts on a computer like this. This computer is vintage and aesthetic only. It is a... Uh, Early 2000s in-win D500 case. Obviously, it could use a retro write. But it's got a 2009 Intel DQ45CB motherboard in it. Socket 775 LG with a... Uh, or Socket LG 775 with a Pentium P8800 3GHz Core 2 Duo in it. Well, this computer is basically a 12-year-old system. It does have a fairly recent 2017 video card in it. And it runs Linux Mint. And it's just a workstation, but it's got a retro aesthetic, kind of like my old gem computer used to have. Because um, I like my workstations to kind of blend in with the vintage ones, so you don't know. But yeah, I use Linux now most of the time at home. You know, when you spend all day supporting Windows issues and you spend all day dealing with, you know, the frustrations of handling corporate Windows installations, you kind of get to a point where you're like, you know what, I need a break from that, but I do still need to use a computer at home from time to time. Might as well use one that doesn't infuriate me. And so this is the case. And this one doesn't really need any work at all. It runs great, it never crashes, never hangs, never locks up, never has problems due to updates, never randomly updates and bricks itself. This did it once when it ran Win 10, but <laughs> yeah, I have the tools and skills. And sorry it's going to be a little messy because we're in flux of figuring some stuff out. Up here, 2015 iMac. This is the one I use for videos every once in a while. I use it for music production. Um, it's probably going to be doing some guitar videos soon. Haven't quite been able to work out how, how I want to do my guitar tone for that because I'm trying to flip between the idea of using my Blackstar ID Core, my cell phone with my, um, for lack of better words, sound font that I use for BandLab, or my Bugera 333XL half stack that I use for playing live. Of course, it's running Mac OS Catalina. It's also not a vintage computer, very much not a vintage computer, but it's a computer, <laughs> and it's a main workstation along with my Linux box. And it doesn't have any of the infuriating problems I've had with Microsoft Windows in the past. Continuing on, this is my most commonly used setup, but with a revolving door of laptops. This is the NEC Versa. And we're seeing number one of my most recent, actually two of my most recent acquisitions. Um, this morning, I went out and had to run some errands, and I saw this little computer shop that I've driven past about like 15 times. And when I was driving past, I saw this shop, and I walked inside, and I wanted to just see what kind of parts and equipment they had, and how much and how old, and stuff like that. Because I go into these places, and sometimes they have really cool stuff. I mean, you know, I found the 
NEC multi-sync monitor that's there in the closet, which is actually hooked up and running, attached to my Tandy there. Um, yeah, I found that at a little hole in the wall in Redmond, Washington. I found this at a computer shop near where I live, and um, how I found it was I was in the store and I was about to leave because, you know, I wasn't going to spend more than maybe about five minutes in there looking at stuff. And I look and I see two CRT monitors sitting up front, and I'm... And I'm not sure what to make of it, because they had LCD panels all over the bloody store. I mean, they they had plenty of paint LCDs, like my daily driver right here, my AOC. But they only had two of these, and they were both beige. And I was like, oh, yeah, all that. Oh, let's ask about it. So I was like, yeah, are these for sale, or are they for recycling? And she said, oh, yeah, we took those in, because I didn't know we weren't supposed to take CRTs in. You can just have them. This is like the fourth fourth or fifth time that's happened in the last five years i like go into a shop and they get these crts in in their wonderful shape i mean this one is like brand spanking new almost it's a kds 15 inch svga with digital controls and it's attached to my at&t docking station 2 which right now has an nec versa v50 in it <laughs> which i shall get out of FTP serve. I'll talk more about this one later, but we'll pull it out and take a look at it because we're talking about the collection and we're talking about what I've got and what the plans are. So I have a big plan to make a video of the entire NEC Versa product line and I had a few dry runs. This one's the V50. This is the one that doesn't have the removable screen on it and you can tell because it's got two latches over here instead of that central one that the others have. And it even says it up there. I mean, it's a Versa V50, which is a 486 DX250, 8 megs of RAM, 540 meg hard drive, and it's probably going to get upgraded to an 80 gig before too long. Six, but I got the. This is actually the lap reason I started getting into getting these Versa laptops um, in part was because I saw Bejovision did a video where he took his completely apart. Now his, you'll notice, he's got two sliders here. He's got one up here for contrast and brightness and one down, one for contrast and one for brightness down here. These were the only version of Ver NEC Versa that came with a DTSN color screen, which is what Bejovision has. And I ended up with the Active Matrix, which is the best screen you can get for gaming. Um, and I am not saying how much I got this for because it was bloody cheap. And I'm really trying not to over-promote these too much, even though I blabber about them all the freaking time. I'm sure everybody's sick of hearing about the damn things when I show up. But, <laughs> yeah, um, I'm trying to still keep them under wraps so they can stay affordable because... And one of the biggest things about retro computers in general, or vintage computers is the proper term. A lot of people call these retro computers. Retro is basically like if I built a facsimile of an NEC Versa and put a Raspberry Pi in it that ran DOS box on top of uh, emulation station. Um, vintage is this. This is a real article from 1994. This one even has 1994 era specs. This is pretty much a laptop like you would find in 1994. And so <clears throat> it's a vintage computer and this is called vintage computing. People call it retro computing, but it's really vintage computing because I'm using the vintage hardware with the vintage software. Granted, not everything's vintage and a lot of mine, I yank out the hard drive and put a big one in it. This one, that's probably going to be the plan. It'll probably end up with an 80 gig and 20 megs of RAM at the end of end of the day at some point and a working battery because I actually like my laptops to be used as laptops and not as a luggable. So, yeah, we're going to talk more and more about the collection. We're going to boot this puppy back up. You can see right there. Um, I took my first foray into retro brighting recently. Um, used some hydrogen peroxide. This thing was horrifically yellowed. I sanded this part and polished it because I was trying to do sort of a two-tone thing. But I actually stuck this in the sunshine in some plain... Um, in some plain uh, hydrogen peroxide and water. And it actually worked because this was like piss yellow before I put it in there. <laughs> yeah, there's, I'm going to put a little picture over it. Yeah. 
And this is actually the CD-ROM drive out of the uh, NEC Ready 9522 that's in there. So, yeah. Um, my second acquisition of the morning was this. A, I haven't measured it. I think it's a 17-inch Dell uh, CRT. Going by, and I don't know, I've heard some of these are Trinitrons. I think this one's a Trinitron. Honestly, I think it's a Trinitron. And it is clean and mint and crisp. So, and this is nice because this means I can quit chasing down CRTs because I really wanted to have, you know, three and one extra. And we'll talk more about that later because that has to do with the purge. Or selling off of some stuff. Yeah, you can see my guitar projects back there. I'm also working on guitar stuff too. Actually, that's going to pick up more in the summer. Um... But yeah, this is a Dell CRT. I just tested it, and I used this computer over here, which this is really my workhorse. This is my vintage workhorse. This is a 1995 NEC Versa P75. You've seen the video on it. It has a battery that works. It's got the 800 by 600 screen on it. It's got 40 megs of RAM and an 80 gig hard drive. Um, it runs CD-ROM based games off of ISO files stored on said hard drive. It has Sound Blaster compatible sound. A little out of character for me because I typically try to stick to 486s, but in the Versa line, really, if you really want a good system for just DOS all around, you can go with the any. You can't go wrong with an NEC Versa P75. I mean, it's got Sound Blaster sound. It's got color graphics. Even though the 800 by 600 is letterboxed, it's in 640 by 480 and 320 by 200. It does have one fix, one thing that I have a complaint about with the 486 versus, and that's if you're choosing to do emulation on these, like uh, Nesticle, or you want to use some older emulators like I do sometimes, because I still prefer to do like just for fun ROM hacking and DOS occasionally. I found Nesticle on the 640 by 480 screens because the way the chipset works, the NES graphics will drift below the screen. And like if I'm playing Dragon Warrior, my speech boxes are cut off and stuff. The 800 by 600 screen gets rid of that problem because it's letterboxed and it's shifted just right. So it's right in the center of the screen. And it actually doesn't look half bad because the letterbox is like that. And smaller size makes the graphics look better anyway. So that's, this one is probably the one that gets used the most and probably the one I'll end up holding on to probably the longest. Um, over here, Dell Inspiron 15. This is my Windows 10 kick around the house computer. It's not a lot of trouble. It's bone stock. The only thing I did was bump the memory up to eight gigabytes. It's got a Pentium U4300 in it, <laughs> which is like this budget Intel processor. It needs charged. <clears throat> But yeah, it's my kick around the house Windows 10 machine. It's just a basic computer um, for basic tasks, basic stuff. And uh, I do use this for like loading software on my Wii's, but you know, that's just kind of my way. Anyway, let's move to the stuff in the closet. So I got the Dell. I took the Micron off when I put the KDS up today. Um, the Micron monitor, I really like this monitor. It looks really good. I adjusted the flyback and the vo focus, so it looks really good. But it is a little yellowed, and one of the main complaints that I've had, and even, you know, when one of the things that just really irks me is it's got all this staining on top. I don't know, someone put some stuff on top of here that stained it. It looks like probably a Gatorade bottle and, like, a cup, and it just stayed on top of the monitor forever and stained it, so... Yeah, I don't think retro brighting is going to get that out of there. But it's it's a working CRT. And in 2021, CRTs are like bloody gold, almost. You know, it, 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 it amuses me because I go to computer shops and I find these things for free. But then I go look on like eBay or Craigslist or OfferUp or FreeCycle. <laughs> well, FreeCycle, probably not. But the other three, yeah, you can go on there like... Rare gaming monitor, 1994, SVGA, full color. It gets even worse when you get into stuff like my uh, NEC Multisync. So let's jump onto the other computers a little bit and look at some stuff. You'll only be able to see part of them anyway. <sighs> so right, here's the big parts box. This is where all my spares are. Um, kept in stack bags, of course. You can see I've got some other boxes, motherboards. 
I've got a spare Dell workstation in here. That was what I was using for a while. Spare PS2 keyboard. Actually, funny thing, my wife picked this keyboard out. She liked the look and aesthetic of it, and we were using it for decor for something a while back. I just put it in here because I didn't want it laying around. Atari video game controllers. Here's one of the first computers on the chopping block this year. I don't, I haven't started offering any of this stuff up yet, but I will be in the future. This is a 1989 Mac SE FDHD. It's the six, six megahertz, 68,000 processor version. 10 inch black and white screen, it works 100%. I had it for a Christmas tree display last year. I bought this in 2007 at Value Village in Everett for 10 bucks. It's still got the original hard drive and the original hard drive still works, even though it's 30 years old. <laughs> I did, th this thing's freaking amazing. It's got four megs of RAM. But the reason why I'm laying it go is one, it's a really nice, um, accurate to the time setup. I have the original keyboard, original mouse, original manuals, original trackball, and it all works and it's all original parts. But I haven't been able to find a PDS slot ethernet card for it. And that really limits my use because I don't use vintage computers like most people do. And I've even gotten into a few little tiffies with people on forums about this because everybody has a differing opinion on, you know, network security and how to load software on. I mean, some people say, oh, just rip out the floppy drive and put a put an SD card in there. I'm like, I don't want to do that. I, I'd rather run it as close to original as possible. Just make it faster. I'd like slap a 10 gig SCSI hard drive in this thing and use that because that's just the way I roll. And then they'd be like, well, why do you have it on your network? It's a security risk. I'm like, unless someone is really, really desperate to hack a guy who really has nothing to really give away, what are they going to steal or acquire off of a Macintosh from 1989? I mean, really, what are they going to do? Rob my Sim Cities? Go ahead. Take my Sim Cities. Spread them around. I've created some pretty epic cities in Sim City. That's actually something I want to do on a Let's Play. But more than likely be using one of these for that. Um, over here we have the NEC Versa 40EC, which is the Ford NEC Versa. It was a Ford Motor Company computer. My uh, hinge fix has been holding up really well. Um, I had the middle hinge cover covered in aluminum foil for like a year and then took it off and cleaned it up and it ended up being absolutely perfect and it looks like it's never been fixed. This one's my M75. This is my second favorite. This actually kind of competes with the P75 as my favorite. It's too bad it doesn't have OPL, but in a way it's a much more silent computer when I'm doing DOS stuff. So the M70, so the specs on these, this is the, this one's got 12 megs of RAM. It's got a 540 meg drive in it. No screen right now because the panel is in the M75 because I've got two more NL6448 AC30 panels that I'm trying to fix <laughs> right now. One's got a bad board and doesn't, when it does work, it's like shifted about that far down the screen. And then the other one, um, the boards went belly up. So I took some boards out of an AC3003 uh, and I'm going to try to wire those in. And uh, one of the screens is going to go to the touch screen that I'm rebuilding. That was originally for the first M75 I had. Um, the M75, though, I freaking love it. And this one I really like because it's clean and it has no cracks on it. I mean, it's like literally a brand new laptop out of the box. I mean, there's no cracks. I mean, whoa, am I starting to get one there? Well... Eh, and this, this is always what, okay, I guess I can't say that anymore. But yeah, this is always what happens with NEC Versa. They always crack over here, but it's like the easiest darn thing to fix. I mean, B Bishop, B, B, B Bishop PCM or has done videos on it. I'm going to be doing one on it sometime. But it's... If that's like the number one problem, other than that, this thing's clean. Even another common problem with the Versa that I used to run into is the space bar sticking. This one doesn't stick. 
And this is a really nice qual nice uh, example. So <laughs> I'm trying to keep it nice by not using it too much. The only thing I had to fix on the whole thing was the track ball here. The uh, little rubber rollers in the VersaTrack cracked and broke. Because it, apparently this thing had been sitting in a computer shop for 10 years unused. And something I learned about the rubber rollers on the VersaTrack. If it was used a lot, those, those rubber rollers don't rot. Because the oils from your skin get into it, and it causes it to, uh, and it causes it to actually kind of lubricate and keep the rollers hy hydrated, so they don't mess up. This will probably be another one of the ones that's going to be a keeper in my collection because I just really like it. Although I really want to get the touch screen put back on this eventually. Um, this one has an 80 gig in it, and it's running triple boot. It's got uh, DOS 7.1, of course, which is Windows, well, DOS 7.0 because it's Windows 95. Windows 95, of course, and then I have Windows 4 Groups 3.11 on here. And the reason why it's set up with Microsoft products instead of free DOS, like I usually like to use, is because um, on this, with the Windows sound system, you can actually, if you have Microsoft Windows installed, you can actually use a special driver shim provided with Windows or provided with the Windows sound system drivers to allow DOS applications to use the digital audio for sound effects and stuff. So if I'm playing SimCity 2000 on this or something else, I can use a Windows sound system setting and I can have audio. Um, it works with uh, Seventh Guest and Shivers and some of those other games. And this thing also has like a thicker screen than normal. So we're gonna put her back up here for a while. Uh, man, here's another one. This is another one in the debate of vintage versus old. This is my real portable workhorse. This is a 19, 2012 IBM ThinkPad T61. It's got a 250 gig SSD in it, four gigs of RAM, and it's got an Intel Core 2 Duo, just like my desktop down there. I don't know if the battery is fully charged or not, but we'll see. I don't think it is. Um, nice screen. You can see it's got some road wear. Um, it's got some broken plastic. This this isn't a vintage collector's piece. This is a workhorse, and this is one of the ones I'm going to keep around. It's my main portable Linux box. I also love the fact it doesn't have a webcam. I don't like webcams on laptops, just because of the whole security thing. You can see the bottom. It's pretty... Yeah, this thing's been through the ringer. This is there's actually a funny story about this laptop. So, I bought this for three dollars from Value Village before I moved to where I am now. And when I bought it, it had it didn't have an asset tag, but it had a sticker that was familiar to me on here, and that sticker had a v dash username on it, which. People know, and it's posted on the internet, that that is a Microsoft vendor account. I have repaired this laptop before. At work. So I have a, a bit of a connection to this before it ever became mine. Now, how it ended up at Value Village, I do not know. But it was there with a Compaq V2000. And they just sort of appeared there. I don't know how they wound up at Value Village, but they wound up there. I just cleaned the stickers off of it, put a new SSD in there, and it's been solid as heck ever since. This panel is a little bit dim, but I don't mind because it's probably better for my eyes. <laughs> but yeah, it's a good, reliable little laptop for guys like me. Uh, back, to, uh, But back to the vintage stuff. Oh yeah, it has PCMCI, well, probably Express slots, but... I don't need cards for it. All right, trying to hide some stuff because I'm shooting this before Valentine's Day. This is, if you saw my other channel when I had, well, I still have it up. I just haven't posted anything. I might even try to put some of those on old videos on here. This is my NEC MultiSync 2 JC1402 HWA. This is another monitor I'll never let go of. And this monitor is awesome, and here's why. This monitor 
is one of the like the second version of the original multi-sync monitors. And this was back when multi-sync actually meant something. These monitors, well, DB9 in back, can have an adapter, which I have it right over here, to convert DB9. Um, I don't know how good of a shot I can get on this, but it's there to convert DB9 for TTL Monochrome, Professional Graphics Adapter, CGA, EGA, Tandy, and other PC standards to SVGA. Not VGA, mind you. Not just mere 640 by 480 16 color VGA. SVGA. This monitor has a maximum resolution of 800... Actually, and I think I got it to do 1024 by 768 once. I was using C tools to install a DDO on a hard drive and it actually brought up 1024 by 768 screen resolution on this monitor from 1988. And it didn't flicker, it didn't smoke, it didn't whine. The picture was a little bit off center, but with some adjustments, I mean, man, I'm never letting go of this thing. And I've read you can get more adapters for it so you can connect this thing to a Commodore 64 or a... <sighs> Commodore Amiga, or you could hook this monitor into just about darn near anything. You could probably use it as a TV set with a TV tuner on it. <laughs> I mean, there's so much. And I put, this was the first monitor I ever opened up and successfully fixed. I had to put some bodge wires in back because a common problem with these uh, NEC Multisync 2 monitors is that the there's a second logic board in the back in its own cage away from all the high voltage stuff that cracks and so I had to put bodge wires over the traces to fix the cracks and it took me a couple tries to get it where it would work both with VGA and with Tandy because there were some of those traces that weren't being used in VGA and it was giving me a false I'm fixed. <clears throat> Moving down here we have my 1985 Tandy 1000A. Um, this is a Original Tandy 1000A, dual 360K floppies. Actually, let's get a little more view here. Dual 360K floppies, but it's a sleeper because it has a 3 gig hard drive high lurking in the back. Oh yeah, and I have the original Tandy 1000 keyboard here, which I got off of an eBay auction because the person who had it didn't know what it was and didn't know how to list it so a normal person looking for a Tandy keyboard could find it. So I found it and got it for about 13 bucks after I'd had this computer for over a year, back in like 2007. So in the most recent thing, right after COVID started, I actually got the rare deluxe two button mouse for it, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Tandy two button deluxe mouse here real quick too. So this is a rare piece and it was actually designed to work with both the Tandy 1000 and with the Coco. And it's really a joystick because it uses the Tandy 1000 joystick interface, which isn't a standard interface. That's what those two ports are. The Tandy is the weirdest amalgamation of an IBM PC and a video game console I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so, yeah, specs on the Tandy, 8088 at 4.77 MHz, 640K RAM, 3 gig hard drive. It has XTIDE, one of the first cards ever made. We'll go into that um, in some other video. Realtek 3C509 LAN, and that's pretty much it. It's pretty simple little beast, but it's fun to play like old DOS games on. Here's, here's one of the for sure keepers. This is the one known as Creeping Net 486. You've probably seen this on my main channel where I was running emulators on it. This thing is got to be the most awesome 486 I've ever put together. That's one reason I'm just holding on to it. This is, the specs are, the case is a case I bought in 2004 off of eBay from BJ Surplus. It was a new old stock XT clone case. There's another YouTuber with a 486 in the exact same case channel I think it's called Dave Just Dave or Dave Just Dave Retro and his, his computer almost looks identical to mine. It's pretty freaking awesome. 
I remember watching the video when he built that thing. I was like, oh my god, dude, you, you, your 486 is starting to look like mine. <laughs> That's kind of cool. So this thing, I'll just try to rattle off the specs. This thing deserves its own video, just with me talking about all the work I've put into this, because this is really my retro computing knowledge over the last 30 years, or 20 years, rolled up into a ball. Um, the case is a new old stock XT clone chassis that I bought off of eBay in 2004. The motherboard I bought off of Vintage Computer Federation forums from a guy for 25 bucks. It's a first international computer FIC 486 PVT socket 3. Uh, AMD AM5 or AMD AM486 DX4100 SV8. So it has the 8. 8K level 2 cache, but it has right back like a Pentium. So it's kind of nifty that way. And when it does get utilized, this thing really, this thing eats this NEC ready down here, which you can't see the front of it right now, alive. Actually, there are two computers in my collection that eat that NEC ready alive. And we'll talk about the NEC next. But this thing, yeah, it's 64 megs of RAM. I have a five and a quarter mobile rack here, which is actually now an amalgamation of two because I took the one on my Tandy because the guts still worked and put those guts into this beige one here. Um, and I've got four or five hard drive caddies for it with everything from Windows 3.1 to DOS to free DOS to Linux. I, had, I can run anything on this. This thing even runs Windows 2000 really well. And I'm working at a way to get XP onto it. Probably another video that would be great for me to do hard drive technologies with this because this darn thing ran a 128 gig M SATA SSD recently. The one that's in my uh, Pentium 4 down there, I put a I went out and bought one of those little white cards from eBay uh, that you could put an M SATA drive in and it converts it to a two two and a half inch uh, 44 pin IDE drive for a laptop. I put that in this computer and I loaded free DOS in 10 minutes. I mean like everything with every package. I mean it ripped through the installation. If you had seen this thing installing free DOS off of DVD to that SATA SSD, you would have thought I was running something like a Pentium 2 at least. No, it was a 486 doing that stuff. And of course, yeah, that's a DVD drive. And I've ripped ISO files with that DVD drive on this 486. And it takes like 15 minutes on hardware that's 30 year, 30 year old technology. <laughs> I mean, this is why I keep messing with this stuff. I mean, it's just not, it, 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 it's just unstoppable. Below it is one of the ones I'm going to probably end up selling. Uh, that's my NEC Ready 9522. This computer's claim to fame is it's actually an LPX form factor. Now, for you lay people, LPX form factor is low profile extended. So if you've ever seen those computers in the 80s, early 1990s, they used to call them pizza box computers. Yeah, the pizza boxes. Those pizza boxes. Those pizza box computers were called were LPX, low profile extended. If you look at the back, it's got everything's massively integrated into it. The, it. It was the first time they ever put everything on the motherboard. So you had sound graphics, video, Ethernet in some cases. This one's got sound graphics and video and serial parallel PS2 ports, all that on the motherboard. And it's got a Pentium 100 and 128 megs of RAM. But somehow this thing eats its lunch on the LAN, LAN gaming doom. And I'm willing to bet it's because of that S3 video card. Because this has onboard Alliance video with one mega ramp. This has an S3 805 with two megs of VRAM. This thing doesn't even drop frames on network games. <laughs> but there's another one that also eats it alive. Why should I have this when I can have that? And then I can use this with it. Because somehow, this NEC Versa P75, even though the processor is about 25 megahertz slower, <laughs> is faster than the Pentium 100. Both from a graphic... Uh, this one, 
drops the, the, the I think the video card's its biggest Akeel's heel, and I don't want to upgrade it. And I'm kind of thinking, and I'll I've never really talked about it, but the reason I got the Versas in the first place in this setup was so that I could have multiple vintage PCs in one spot, and I didn't always have to be in here when I wanted to do stuff. Because I would be like, okay, I want a 4860X2. Okay, well, I grab my 40C that's up there, or my V50 that's over here, and I boot that one up and use it. Do I want a DX4100 that day? Maybe Windows 95? I'll take my M75 down, and I'll plug it into that. If I want to run, you know, something that needs a Pentium, or Sound Blaster, I go over and grab my P75. It's over there on the theater room chairs, where I'm cleaning stuff up and sorting stuff up. At least I will be when I'm not busy procrastinating by filming videos. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to talk about that. So the AC Ready, I don't think it's time with me as much longer. It's just it, it's just not special to me. I mean, I grew up... The, computers were still exciting in the 486 era. You had all these buses and stuff that you could mess with to try and keep it down from me going on a long... expounding about a 486 <laughs> and all the merits. That's for another video. So we're going to move down here into my Gem Computer Products 286. You guys might be familiar with this one because, yeah, this was actually the last computer I bought when I lived in Alabama. I paid 35 bucks for it on eBay just as the 286 and 8088 stuff started getting expensive in the mid-2000s. I bought this... <sighs> I'm getting a little of the weird nostalgic feels because someone commented on one of my videos who I was in a band with like two weeks ago. And so this was kind of <sighs> begotten because... Ah. So this was kind of begotten because uh, the brand name, because Gem Computer Products was a company that made computers in Norcross, Georgia for the U.S. military. And they were actually a subsidiary of a company called MEC or Micro Equipment Corp. It was also based out of Norcross, Georgia. And then in the late 80s, they made a in-mall shop that I think I may have walked past before called Seymour, the new vision. And Seymour was their line of stores where I think they sold both Gem and Mech branded computers. And I've ran across a Mech before, and it kind of gave me the same vibes these old Gems do. I know it's weird because they're just basically a baseline, regular white box computer maker, but they, the, the thing I always found amusing about them was they use these ginormous full AT cases for everything, and then they have a little itty bitty motherboard. Like inside this full AT case is a baby AT Octec Revision 5.1 motherboard. Um, it is a 286, it's 12 megahertz, overclocked from 10 because I have a IIT 80C287 math coprocessor in there. And then it's a bit more hopped up than it originally was. I think when I got it, it had just regular VGA and a 540 meg drive. This has got a uh, Sang Labs ET4000 SVGA card in it, one megabyte. So this thing is pretty much almost on the same fighting class as my 486 graphics wise. Um, the other thing, the other specs, three gigs SCSI hard drive. It's got, I think, a two or four X NEC SCSI CD-ROM and the regular array of 1.2 and 1.4 meg floppy drives in it. It runs MS DOS 6.2.2 and like four or five different pre Windows 3, Windows 95 versions of Windows, <laughs> including 1.01, .01, which is just on there for giggles. Um, but. The, the reason, the big thing about why I haven't talked about the future of the gem or Tandy or why I'm going to keep them is I'm not sure yet. We've got two computers here. Now, we're going to talk about them. First off, the gem. This thing also makes a great XT clone because it has a turbo button on it. And if I turn that off, it actually runs like an XT. And it does a real good job of running old, like, CGA and EGA games at the proper speed. But I have my Tandy 1000 to do all that. And it runs everything perfectly and hardly ever has any problems at all either. And this runs MS-DOS 622 as well. But I don't use Windows with it. I don't need to. Because I'm getting away from Windows and getting more and more into running these things on pure DOS. So <clears throat> the competition is going to be Tandy 1000... 
versus the gem because the gem was more about the brand name for me. The Tandy was really about having three voice sound and, you know, the uh, upscale graphics, but still having that raster line CGA thing. It's just something about the aesthetic of using the Tandy 1000 that just really appeals to me. And I'm building a light pen for it. But it all kind of hinges on me figuring out where... So... The competition is Gem 286 versus Tandy 1000. Which one should I keep? Because I'm pretty pretty much I only really need the Tandy's special features for a very certain subset of early DOS games that only the Tandy can do that sound on because it's got the three voice uh, Texas Instruments sound chip in it. Now I could get the Gem to do all that if I got one of those Tandy sound cards. But I've heard those are kind of problematic, and I don't know if I want to fiddle with that or not. So I was thinking I'm going to do this. I'm going to get one of those Tandy sound cards for the gem. I'm going to go ahead and try it out against the Tandy 1000. Then whichever one is the better computer, I'll end up keeping that one. But today, I got an extra monitor, so that might change the whole game altogether. Because then I could put that monitor on this have the Tandy with the NEC, and then my 486 can get the big 17-inch monitor, because this sucker can pump out some screen resolutions, let me tell you. This, uh, this thing is like a graphics workstation from 1995. <laughs> it's pretty nuts. And it's a pretty epic setup when it's fully set up. So that's kind of the thing. I'm going to let that one go, that one go, and then these two. But if I were to downsize, I'm... Her thing is, I've got this. If I can get my hands on an old enough ultralight Versa, like one of the very first ones that were 20 or 25 megahertz, I could probably get it to cover all the stuff that the gem runs that my faster 486 has run too fast. And so then, I wouldn't need the gem anymore, and I'd have, you know, laptops that take up one shelf in my closet, and I could just interchange them on the same setup. And then if I want a LAN game... I've got a comparable graphics card to this, and then the user experience between Creeping Net 486 and my Versas is consistent. Genius. <laughs> so that's kind of what the state of the collection is. And it doesn't stop there. I've got a Pentium 4 again. I've got it's a Dell Dimension 3000 from 2003. It's got 128 gig MSATA hard drive mounted into a 44 pin enclosure. Yeah. So that 44 pin enclosure, you know, I got it in there and it's just got a DVD drive. But I might not need this anymore either because I got this guy over here, my trusty handy dandy beige box. And I just recently figured out through Lutris how I could get a bunch of old Windows games working. So I don't even need to bother with Windows on this crap anymore. Anything Windows, I can play on that computer over there and put a bunch of scalers over it because that modern video card will do stuff. And then these guys can happily run DOS in the way that they're the most productive. And, it, yeah, it all just sort of works out. The pieces are finally coming together. I will finally can stop trade, buying, selling, and trading this stuff because I'm trying to get one conclusive, one cohesive collection of working hardware together that I can actually use and that's sort of the thing. That, that That's the whole goal of this. Um, there is some other computers. There is one other computer. I do have one of the ultralights, but it got completely cracked into pieces during shipping, and, you know, that's what that is. Now, I'll show you some stuff that nobody's ever gotten to see. Hmm. <laughs> This is the software collection. We're a part of it. Um, got some stuff that people have just thrown away over the years. I got this Crystal Reports thing. I've got some other software up here I'm keeping safe. I've got a Sound Blaster MIDI kit with Voitra S Sequencer Pro. This is my box for my USB transfer tool. Yeah, this is some scraps from a Wii. <laughs> Let's put those up there. These are the manuals for um, my Mac. 
Um, looking over here, yeah, this is what some of the software I have is. The Sound Blaster MIDI kit, Wing Commander 2 in the original box. I got that back in the Alabama days. TIE Fighter I got from my brother-in-law. I bought this, I got real lucky. I bought this original floppy copy of X-Wing at Goodwill like three years ago. I, I pulled LGR's, I took a page from LGR's book and I just went into the uh, aisle where they sell like board games and this was sitting in there. I was like, yep, that's mine. Bye. <laughs> and this this is a really killer haul right here up, up to Monkey Island. This is all $20 from here to here that I paid for all these big box DOS games back in like 2010. Maybe 2008. I don't remember when. But there was a store in Everett called the Liquidation Store. And I went in there and bought all these. And it was around the same time that my Tandies turned up at the thrift shop. So I'm wondering if these were originally with those Tandy 1000s. Um, yeah. Some of those games include the original Police Quest. The Emperor's Bee Quest, complete with feelies. A triple value pack. Sierra's value pack, which includes Police Quest... 3, Manhunter 2, and Hoyle Book of Card Games, which is fun to play with that deluxe mouse. Gold Rush, the original AGI version. Manhunt, King's Quest 3, AGI. The Black Cauldron, Space Quest, Space Quest 2, and uh, the King's Quest 4, The Perils of Rosella. And I believe this is the SCI port of it. Down. I have The Secret of Monkey Island, my original copy. Well, actually, my sister's original copy that she gave to me, and the discs still work. And it is beat to hell, and the dial of pirate wheel is held together with a nut and a bolt at this point. But <laughs> this is the copy of Monkey Island I play, and this is the original VGA release from 1990, I think 1990 or 1991. A Linksys Etherfast 16 in the original box. Really strange game called Super Casino that I got from my buddy Norm a few years ago. An original box copy of Sin, Sim Ant for DOS. I have a typing teacher. Don't even need that. Big box font editor called Fontmonger. <laughs> yeah, a little modem here. Turbo C++ on five and a quarter. OS 2 2.1 with multimedia pack and WinOS 2. You can run Windows software, OS 2 software, and it comes with the sound card drivers. And then Microsoft Basic for my, uh, this is going to be another included with my uh, Macintosh. Um, some spare five and a quarter floppies in a box. And that's pretty much it. I've got some boxes of just loose discs and stuff like that. But yeah, there's my five and a quarter stash right there. But yeah and all my Mac OS installation disks. But yeah, that's pretty much the state of the collection in 2020 or 2021. Why did I mess that up? Yeah. Oh yeah, and here's my box with some of my Versa projects in it. So yeah, we're having the do. We have a lot, we have a lot in store for the new year. As I try to close the door. So yeah, there's a lot in store for the new year. Selling computers, getting my setups right, maybe even selling a monitor or two. Who knows? We'll see. But rest assured, there's going to be plenty of Versa videos, some Let's Plays, and a lot of projects on my table. Anyway, this is CreepyNet signing out.